Welcome to Eastside, where we gather, all of us, each in different stage of our spiritual journey, young and old, all races and colors. We don't exist for ourselves, but for people, people that haven't been invited, people that haven't been cared for, who have walked away from God, people of a past that pushes others away. It's about the hurting and those who have lost hope. We gather as one church, not as individuals, not as separate campuses, but as a family pushing towards the same thing, knowing that Jesus was not for the select few, but for all of us. We believe Jesus is the hope in a world of darkness, and it's through His church that the world will find light. We believe who we choose to be today will determine the world of tomorrow. So we have a vision, to begin each day with purpose, to open our hearts and minds to learn something new, to let go of our comfortable living to reach the searching, the broken, the hurting, to focus on what really matters, to band together and fight against the darkness, a vision to be the church Jesus called us to be. This isn't just a church. Eastside is a movement of people who gather together with Jesus declaring, this is for everyone. Well, hello everybody, welcome to Eastside. We're so glad you're here. Come on, let's stand together. Let's worship today. Let's get those hands up.
teach you guys a new song today. It goes like this, and we worship the God who was. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. today joy in this house in the bible first peter chapter 2 it says that we ourselves are like spiritual houses being built up and our foundation is jesus christ the chief cornerstone and for those that lean on him depend on him and believe in him those people will not be disappointed let's reaffirm our faith as we sing today my hope is built on nothing less than jesus in jesus blood and I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. The name above all names, the name that saves. Let's sing that again, church. Come on. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. I dare not trust 
with us today. You can go ahead and take a seat. My name is JJ. If we haven't met, I'm one of the worship leaders here. And uh, this Monday, as a country, we're going to stop and celebrate Memorial Day. And I think for so many of us, we can often forget what the true meaning of that day is. And it's a day we observe to truly stop, respect, and honor the brave men and women who gave their all. Where we stop to honor those who paid such a high price, defending the freedom that we have in this country. And I'm also aware that in a room this big and with a number of you watching online, there are many of you whose lives were forever changed by a loved one who literally gave their all and gave their life for this country. And so maybe for you, yeah, we can clap for them, yeah. You know, maybe for you that was a parent or a grandparent, a brother, sister, an aunt, uncle, cousin, or maybe even just a really close friend. And so I know for many of you, this may be a really hard weekend and so we want to honor you today, and I just want to take a moment and, uh, and pray for you. So Heavenly Father, when I think of the brave men and women who gave everything, God, for this country, for our freedom, God, I'm floored. And I'm inspired and humbled by the bravery and the selflessness of that decision. Father, I'm also mindful of the people whose lives were forever changed by the loss of a loved one. And so, Father, I just ask that you would comfort them. God, would you hold their pain? Would you hold their grief? God, and especially this weekend, as a lot of those feelings can come back. And so, Father, we love you. We trust you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, as we're in this moment, 
Yeah, come on, we can clap for him again. Yeah. As we're in this moment concentrating on our freedom and the sacrifice that's associated with it, we're going to enter into a time of communion. And communion, it's a very special time where we pause and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross so that we could have freedom, so that we could have life. And unlike the freedom that, that our country, nation, that our nation has to continually fight for, the work that Jesus did on the cross, it defeated death and sin once and for all. And so it's because of that sacrifice that we can walk in freedom. And so every week we take a piece of bread and we remember Christ's body that was broken. We take a cup of juice, remember his blood that was shed on the cross and we give thanks. And so find your way and you didn't receive a communion cup and you wanna participate, go ahead and raise your hand and one of our change makers will get one to you. And if you're joining us online and you wanna participate and grab some bread or some crackers and some juice, whatever it is that you have. And then together, let's just enjoy this time to be still and remember all that Jesus has done for us. pray together to end this communion time. God, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here this weekend with all these wonderful people in person and online. And um, God, we're just above all else grateful for you and for your son and the fact that you truly did give all uh, so that we could inherit eternity. And, and we thank you for that now. In your heavenly name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. You know, those communion times is really a, a celebration and remembrance of the fact that God really did give all through his son, Jesus Christ. And every weekend at Eastside, uh, we take some time to celebrate uh, and remember uh, another act of generosity, but this time uh, we get to give, right? And, and because we believe that God is really, really good, and because we believe that he has our best interest in mind as a church, uh, we talk about tithes and offerings, which is a simple way to say, hey God, everything I have is yours, and so I'm gonna bring uh, just a portion of, of my finances to you to show you that I believe you're good, and again, I, I think you have our best interest as a church in mind, and we wanna celebrate today, okay? Our, our church is 59 years old, okay? 59 years old, we're gonna be 60 next year. We're eligible for all the senior specials as a church. We're really excited about it, okay? And we believe that there's a whole lot more good. And so we're planning for the next 60 years, okay? And uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in, in partnering with us financially, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can go to eastside.com slash give. Uh, you can, if you got the Eastside app, there's a way to give on there as well. Um, and if you brought a check with you today, you can drop it in one of the black giving boxes located uh, at each of your exits. And uh, again, 60 years, we're thinking long-term here, we're planning for the future. Uh, and there's two opportunities that I'd love to extend to you if you wanna do that personally as well. On Saturday, June the 5th, uh, at 9 and 10.30, we've got two different opportunities. Uh, seminars, if you will. Uh, one is a trust and will seminar. Uh, my family and I will, will probably be at that one. Uh, and the next is a creative generosity. Those are just two things as you're thinking about the future of you and your family uh, that I think would be, would be beneficial for you to check out. And there's more info on the website. And by the way, uh, welcome to Eastside, everybody. Happy Memorial Day weekend. My name's Landon, I'm on the high school team here, and uh, if you chose to be here with us for the first time today, we're just, we're glad you're here, uh, whether you're watching online or in person. Um, we've got a gift for you simply for, for showing up or, or checking out the live stream. 
Uh, if you're on campus with us, uh, you just need to go to the Guest Central kiosk after the service. There's an Eastside Orange Travel Cup. If you go to eastside.com slash connect, there's a team of people that would love to give you that free gift. Um, for those of you that are watching online, um, same offer to you. We'll actually mail that gift to you. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then as we move into this summer season, just a couple announcements that we're really excited about. First, uh, you may have seen that the cafe and the grill area was renovated within the last couple months. Looks pretty good, if I do say so myself. And I see so many of you going in there and getting coffee and donuts on a Sunday morning. Uh, but we want to make sure you know the grill is back open and there's some great affordable options, but that's only going to be on Saturday nights. So I know most of you in here, maybe you're Sunday people, but we want you to know Saturday night is open. The grill is open. We've got affordable options for you and your family. A bunch of people came out last night and just had an absolute blast watching TV and hanging out together, sitting by the fire pits, eating burgers. So check out the grill on Saturday nights uh, if you're available uh, on a Saturday. It really is a great experience. And then the last thing, and this is really important, okay, and we're gonna celebrate this, but okay, let me, let me get through it first before I, you, 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 know, you start to jump up and down and celebrate or do whatever you're gonna do, okay? So we've been partnering with this organization called Tijuana Christian Mission, which is an orphanage uh, in Tijuana and Rosarito, Mexico for a long, long time. Okay? And they let us know about a need that they had. Uh, <clears throat> it's Again, it's an orphanage, and they didn't have adequate housing for everybody in their care. So they take these kids and students out of a really destitute situation, and their goal is to put a roof over their head and obviously educate them and then teach them about the Lord. So we were able to partner with them to be able to build something that's called a super dorm. So they took kids out of a destitute situation and because of you and your generosity, we were able to finish this super dorm, but there's more, okay? These kids are about to go into the super dorm for the first time, and we want to welcome them in the only way I know that East Side people can. So if you wanna to put together a welcome home basket for these students so when they come in this dorm, okay, their eyes go like this, and they can't believe that you, people they don't know and maybe will never meet, thought about them. If you want more information on that, you can go to eastside.com slash beyondborders. If you're on campus with us, there's a compassion kiosk as well. But how cool is it that we were able to meet a need because of you and your generosity, and now there were kids that were on streets in Tijuana and Rosarito, Mexico, that are no longer. I think that's something to celebrate. <clears throat> So eastside.com slash beyond borders, they got all kinds of information. Be a great thing for you to do with your small group as well, which you're gonna hear a lot about today. And now we get to hear a story about how a small group changed somebody's life. Hi, my name is Bob Carey, and I lead a small group called the Brothers in Faith. We've been together since uh, 2017. We connected with Patrick of the Salvation Army. And then they mentioned in these hot summers, uh, we can use uh, a few more canopies uh, in the area. So we've been here uh, over the course of a couple of weeks, putting in uh, four gazebos throughout this area, and then the irrigation uh, in this entire garden area. When we're here, uh, when we're working here, when we're serving the people that are here, uh, it's, it's really amazing feeling the closeness of God in our hearts and, and around this area. Sometimes we don't always feel God. We don't always feel the Holy Spirit, but will we serve? Uh, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing feeling. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is smiling with inside of us. It really creates a brotherly bond. It's just an amazing thing that working and serving together uh, really uh, cements that, that bond that can last a lifetime. It's a great way for your small group to grow your relationships together, to, to become uh, friends, and to create those bonds for life. Well, I am so thankful for the small groups of Eastside and all these amazing stories like this one when groups come together and they make friends and they follow Jesus and they make a difference. The best part of Eastside doesn't happen in these weekend services. The best part of Eastside, by far, happens when we circle up during the week in a small group. And I love how Bob just talked about the value of serving together because the reality is everything is better together. I mean, serving is better together. Celebrating a new job or a promotion is better together. Navigating the loss of a loved one is better together, surrounded by people who genuinely care about you. 
And that's why we do small groups, because life is better when we're together building community, which is one of the primary values of this church. And so I hope you'll just check out eastside.com slash groups. There's all kinds of opportunities this summer. You can go right to your Eastside app and find the opportunities. Or you can go out to the small group expo in the lobby at all of our campuses today and explore all the summer options that we have. Go kick the tires, look around, ask questions, talk to people. Uh, You'll be grateful that you did. So how are you today? Are you good? I'm really glad you're here. We're uh, in our upstream series. And I want to ask you to help me give a great big Eastside family welcome to everyone who's on the other side of the camera in Park Rapids and Bellflower and Redlands, outdoors Anaheim, indoors, everybody in our online family. Uh, We're having more and more people transition from online to on campuses every weekend. And I just want to say to those of you at home today near an Eastside physical campus, if you haven't made that transition yet, now is the time. And listen, I don't know who needs to hear this, but if you can go to Costco, you can go to church. If you can go to Walmart, you can go to church. Amen? And we'd love to see you at an Eastside campus next weekend. There is just something transcendent. There's something supernatural. We just experienced it in the room, worshiping together, being together. That can only happen when we're together. So let me ask you, when you think about the journey that we have been on over the last year as a nation and as a globe, like, just think about it. What's the one word that comes into your mind to describe it? Some of you might say, oh, coronavirus. But the one word for me that defines where all the challenges and pandemics and racism and politics have brought us is the word divided. Instead of these challenges uniting us, they seem to have irreparably divided us. Divided families, divided communities, divided schools, divided churches, divided the country. And we seem to have divided over everything. We, we divided over politics. We divided over CNN and Fox News. We divided over race. We divided over schools, open, closed. We divided over mask or no mask or mask optional. We even divided over Chick-fil-A and Popeye's. <laughs> the spicy chicken sandwich wars rage on. <laughs> and today in our culture, When people make mistakes, what do we do? We cancel them. We've even coined a term for it. We call it cancel culture. In a cancel culture, people constantly are writing each other off and shame and guilt and ridicule rule the day. But today in our upstream series, we come to a very countercultural approach to handling our conflicts, our divisions, our relational bumps, our crashes. Some of you are in conflict right now with a family member, a boss, a mother-in-law, a spouse, a school, a neighbor. And you're ready to cancel them, or maybe you already have. I heard one husband say, my, my wife and I never go to bed angry. We haven't had any sleep for about five weeks now. (laughs) Before you cancel them, before you write them off, Jesus has some very upstream kind of wisdom from the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, which is nearly polar opposite to anything we're seeing and experiencing and hearing in our culture today. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, he said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the mercy full. Blessed are those who are just full of mercy. Blessed are those who don't write others off, who don't cancel others, but who show and extend mercy. Now, right away, I, I know the biggest question you probably have is, yeah, but why should I extend mercy? Why, why, why should I forgive those who've hurt me? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is because God has forgiven me of so much. And if God has forgiven me of what I didn't deserve, shouldn't I forgive others? Colossians 3.13, 
Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. If I've invited God into my life, as we've kind of been walking through these Beatitudes, if I've acknowledged that I'm poor in spirit and I've mourned over my sin and I've humbled myself to God and if I'm hungering and thirsting after righteousness and if I've experienced the incredible forgiveness for my truckload of sin, then now I must extend that same kind of forgiveness to others. Romans chapter two, verse four says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? I mean, does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? And if God in his kindness has given me grace when I deserved his anger, I deserved his justice, then who am I to withhold that from those who have hurt me? Listen, You will never have to forgive anybody more than God has already forgiven you. Now, I know some of you are saying today, well, I can't think of anybody I haven't forgiven. I thought you might say that. So so let me help you by trying to jog your memory a little bit. Anybody owe you money that they haven't repaid? Anybody broken a promise to you? Anybody been over-controlling, said some harsh words, a wife, a husband, a sister, a child, a parent, an employee, or friend? Has someone been hypercritical of you? Is that enough to get you started, or do I need to go on? The Bible says to forgive others just as Jesus has forgiven you. That means we may, as Jesus has forgiven us, we may have to absorb some of the pain just like Jesus absorbed pain on the cross. You see, forgiveness is relinquishing our right to retaliate and doing our best to restore the relationship. And I know you're saying, but they owe me, Gene. My parents hurt me bad, they owe me. Those kids I went to school with, they owe me. My brother owes me. That old boyfriend, owes me. That spouse owes me. I mean, if I let them off the hook, it just wouldn't be fair. They need to pay. But a merciful person says, just as Jesus has paid the price for me, I'll pay it myself. I'll absorb the hurt in myself and let the offender go free. You see, we owe God, but God didn't give us fair. He gave us his son. And he paid the debt that our sins racked up. But our human nature rears its ugly head and we cry out for justice, for retribution, for cancel culture. And we get like this adrenaline rush watching movies, you know, where the really evil guy gets payback. And we are easily deceived into thinking that true release, that real freedom for us lies in revenge. But that's a lie which is the second reason I must forgive, because bitterness never works, ever. I heard about a guy who was driving down the street recently, and he saw this beautiful Mercedes sitting in a yard with a for sale sign on it. And he'd always wanted a Mercedes, but, but this one was only a couple years old, and he was sure he couldn't afford it. But he just stopped anyway, and he asked what the price was. And to his surprise, the woman at the house said all she wanted for it was $500. $500. So without a second, he, you know, a second of hesitation, he whips out his checkbook, he purchases the car, and as he stuck the title in his pocket, he asked her, I, I gotta ask you, why are you selling this Mercedes so cheaply? And she said, well, several days ago, my husband ran off with a woman from his office, and he just texted me from Cancun and told me to sell his car and send him the money. We love to get revenge like that, right? (laughs) There's only one problem with that. It doesn't work. Revenge and bitterness never release us. It only makes us go deeper. Let me share with you a couple scriptures here. Job chapter five, verse two. To worry yourself to death with resentment would be a foolish, senseless thing to do. Notice that word foolish. That says resentment 
is foolish. Why? Because resentment causes people to do stupid things that only end up hurting themselves. I mean, just putting it honestly, bitterness is stupid, and it causes you to do stupid things. It's irrational. It's unhealthy. It's unproductive. Did I mention it's stupid? Job chapter 18, verse 4 says, you are only hurting yourself with your anger. You're just stewing and spewing, all upset about something. Someone maybe who hurt you could have been five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. They may have even forgotten it, or they may have even passed away by now. But in your anger, you're allowing them to continue to hurt you. Resentment can't change the past, the problem, or the person. It only hurts you. I've never talked to anybody who's carrying bitterness, and they say, I just feel so much better being bitter. <laughs> I mean, have you? The most unhappy people I know are people who are carrying a grudge. Look with me at Job chapter 21, beginning in verse 23. Some people stay healthy till the day they die. They die happy and at ease. Others have no happiness at all. They live and die with bitter hearts. Friends, research shows the unhealthiest emotion people have is resentment because it's like a cancer that eats you alive. It's poison, and it has physical consequences. For instance, have you ever said, that guy is a pain in the neck? <laughs> and he literally may be. That may be the cause of the pain in your neck and your headaches. And it's been my experience that a lot of people, they're sick or they stay sick because of unresolved bitterness in their lives. You see, it's not so much what you eat, but what eats you that will kill you. Nothing drains you emotionally like bitterness. Maybe it's thinking of that person, that former girlfriend, that boyfriend, that former husband or wife who hurt you. Maybe it was a teacher who embarrassed you. Maybe you never got over the person you were dating who who dropped you and, and never said anything about it. Or the parent who never told you that they loved you and, you and you hold it all in. Friends, that drains your body of energy. It prolongs the hurt and it's kind of an emotional suicide that in turn leads to depression and additional stress and fatigue. For many reasons, unforgiveness, I mean, it's just a really bad option. Now, here's a third reason you and I need to forgive. Because I'll need more forgiveness in the future. Unless you plan on living a perfect life from this point on, you're going to need forgiveness in the future. Let's go back to Jesus' words in this beatitude again. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be what? Say it. Shown mercy. That's saying, if you give mercy to others, you'll receive mercy. Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer. Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Now, notice these next three words. As we forgive. As we forgive those who trespass against us. That can be a dangerous prayer because if the Lord forgives your trespasses based on how you forgive the trespasses of those who've hurt you, how forgiven are you? Jesus says in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, when you're praying, first, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Can we go back to that? There we go. So that your Father in heaven will be able to forgive your sins too so that the Father in heaven will be able to forgive your sins too. The Bible says we can't receive what we're unwilling to give. John Wesley was a famous Christian leader back in the 1800s, and a guy came to him one time and said, I can never forgive that person, never. And John, John Wesley said to him, then I hope you never sin. So do you, who do you need to be merciful to today? this week, in your life? Who have you canceled? If I could, I just want to do something kind of unusual right now. I just want to stop right here at the halfway point of the message before we go to the next beatitude. 
And I just want to ask you to bow your head with me for a moment. And let's just do business with God right now, just on this point. Just on this point. Maybe God's stirring something in you that you need to forgive right now, to let go of the bitterness and to just be free right now. Just where you are, just silently pray, God, God, thank you for being so merciful to me and extending your grace to me through Jesus. And just say, God, I admit, I I haven't shown that same kind of mercy toward those who have hurt me. Instead, I've held on to my bitterness and my anger and my thirst for revenge for way too long. So God, I'm asking you to help me right now to forgive and to let go. God, because you have forgiven me of so much because bitterness is tearing me up inside and because I know I'll need more forgiveness and mercy in the future, I choose to forgive. Let it go. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That feels good, doesn't it? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You will be shown mercy. Now, Jesus moves strategically from this thought about forgiveness to this next upstream attitude in the very next verse, where he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, I want to do just a little quiz, a test of how pure in heart all of us are, because I have a feeling most of us try to make ourselves look better than we really are. And so I want you to just raise your hand at every campus, let's do this, if you can relate to any of these scenarios. How many of you, like, have ever been watching TV and you heard a car pull up out front or into the garage, it might have been your parents, a spouse, a roommate, whoever, and you turn off the TV in order to pretend you've been doing something productive. Just show of hands on that. Has anybody ever done that? (laughs) I've done that too. I've done that too. Next one. Have you ever had someone like mention the name of a person or the name of a book title or something that you felt like you should have known and even though you didn't know it, you pretended like you did? Has anybody ever done that? I've done that too. How many of you have ever been to a store or restaurant and someone comes up to you and knows you and you act like you know them also, but for the life of you, you have no idea who they are? Just raise your hand. Yeah, confession time. To be honest, this happens to me about any time I'm anywhere and someone makes eye contact with me. Because I just figure they're an East Sider, so I just fake it all the time with you guys. Last one. Have you ever been driving and the person in the other lane is trying to catch your eyes so that you'll let them over? Now, hang on and wait till I'm done. And you have no intention of letting them over, so you just pretend like you don't see them. And instead of looking like a jerk, you just look like you are a very unobservant, nice person. Has anybody ever pulled that one? Oh, okay. Well, I've stooped pretty low in my day. I've never done that one. I I can't believe how wicked you guys are. This is a wicked church. (laughs) Trying to look better than we are happens all the time, even in church, maybe especially in church. There is something in all of us that makes us want to look nicer and more patient and more generous and more spiritual than we really are. And this is nothing new. Jesus was talking to a culture obsessed with appearances, obsessed with ceremonial cleanliness, obsessed with looking good on the outside while not worried about the inside. Jesus would say to the religious leaders, you're like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but in the inside, you're full of dead people's bones. So it was into that culture and into our culture where we try to make ourselves appear better than we really are that Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Now, what does it mean to be pure in heart? When we refer to the heart, 
we're often talking about in our culture of emotions. I love you with all my heart. I have a broken heart. But when the Jews who made up Jesus' audience at that time of the Sermon on the Mount talked about the heart, they were referring to the intellect, to your mind, to your will. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. The heart is the control tower for our desires, our affections, our thoughts, our reasoning, imagination, conscience, and beliefs. Jesus said to love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. The heart is the place where the motives for everything that we do originate. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he was saying a pure heart equals authenticity authenticity. You don't pretend to be something on the outside that's different than what you really are on the inside. You don't pretend to be spiritual at church and then devious and deceiving in your business. You don't talk God talk spiritual language when you're with your small group and then swear like a blue streak at work. Authenticity means there's consistency between what's in your heart and what's on the outside because we all know you can do the right thing and still have the wrong motive. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, God says, these people say they are mine. They honor me with their lips, but their, what? Hearts are far from me. I think this is hard for us because most of us are so accustomed to wearing masks these days to kind of cover up who we really are. Literally, we've been wearing masks for a year to cover up who we really are. One mother replied to an article that she'd seen, and and, uh, she said, our daughter is an army sergeant in Fort Stewart, Georgia, and she called during a very intense leadership training course that required her to spend six weeks at a forest encampment in tough conditions. And she said, Mom, I've met someone here. I'd like to know better, but we're not allowed to wear makeup here, so he has no idea what I really look like. We're so accustomed to masking the outside that authenticity from the inside comes hard. Friends, Jesus was serving notice on the hillside that day that his fundamental focus will always be the heart, the people with a pure heart, the people who are authentic will be blessed. And just the opposite is true. If you live with phoniness and mask and pretension, you'll be Miserable. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who have authenticity between what's on the inside and what people see on the outside. Now, how do we get a pure heart? Because the Bible is clear, our hearts are not pure. We need Jesus to purify our hearts. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. In our hearts, if you go a little later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about in our hearts, there's dishonesty and adultery and hate and gossip and slandered and greed and lust. But Jesus can cleanse our hearts. Jesus is the one who makes them pure. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. See that word pure? We get our word cathartic from that word. A doctor uses a catheter to cleanse the body of physical impurities. A psychiatrist speaks of a catharsis in terms of an emotional cleaning of the mind, of hostile attitudes. The Bible speaks of a spiritual catharsis that purifies, that cleanses the heart. Acts 15, 9 says, he purifies their hearts by faith. Jesus purifies our hearts by faith. When we say yes to Jesus and I say, I believe he's the son of God, I repent of my sin, and we're not ashamed to confess him and be baptized into him. He cleanses our hearts, purifies our hearts. God says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. He spiritually purifies our hearts by his blood. 
It's falling on our knees and saying, God, through the blood of Jesus, change my heart. Forgive me. Purify my heart. Cleanse me. Now, how do you stay authentic? How do you maintain a pure heart? Well, you have to keep leaning into God's grace because none of us will be perfect. But you also have to realign your priorities. The very first 10 of the very first of the 10 commandments, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods. God says, I want top priority in your life. I'm not going to play second fiddle to anybody or anything else. I don't want to have any rivals, whether it's your career, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, anything. I want to be number one. You see, a God is anything that is first place in your life. So how do you know what's first place? How do you know what your priorities are? Well, one indication is you look at your accounting. You say, well, Gene, what do you mean by that? Well, just let me just share what Jesus says later on in the Sermon on the Mount, the very next chapter, Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse 19, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And then he says, for where your treasure is, there your what? Heart will be also. Jesus is saying, wherever invest your treasure, what's your treasure? It's your time, it's your talent, it's your money. That's where you put your heart. I could ask you what's first place in your life right now, and you could say, well, you know, God's first place in my life. But a quick look at your calendar and bank account and a quick look at my calendar and bank account would tell the real story about what's first place in our lives. Regardless of what we say is priority, the way we spend our time and our money tells where our heart is. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. So let's say, like, you become authentic. You develop a pure heart. What are the results of that? What can you expect? Jesus says you can expect two things. First, he says, you will be happy. That's what the word blessed means, happy. Happy are the pure in heart. And do you know why you're going to be happy? Because you won't be faking it anymore. You won't be a phony anymore. You won't be pretending to be something that you're not to just get the applause and the approval of people. And then second, he says, you will see God. Those of you who wear contacts or glasses like I do know that when your lenses are really dirty, you can't see too well. And when your lenses are dirty, everything else looks dirty. And listen, you can't see God when your heart is dirty. You won't see God when you're living a life of mixed motives. You need a pure heart in order to see God. I like how the message version of the Bible puts this beatitude. It says, you're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind, your heart put right then you can see God in the outside world. When your heart is pure, you will see God working through your life. You will see God moving and leading and guiding in your circumstances. You will see God in creation. You will see God at work in other people. And you will see God in heaven someday. When you get your heart right internally, you start seeing God everywhere externally. Now, here's what you need to understand. Jesus is not at war with your heart. Jesus is at war for your heart. And it's why he wants you to go upstream and to do just the opposite of everybody else. And instead of carrying grudges and being full of bitterness and resentment and hatred and canceling everybody, he knows you're going to be happier if you are full of grace and mercy and that in turn you will be shown mercy. Jesus is after your heart because he knows that a pure heart and being the same person on the inside and the outside is the key to seeing God at work in your life now and forever. 
So today, I wanna give you an opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus, to place your trust in Jesus. I mean, there are people seated all around you right now who will tell you the relationship with Jesus that many of you have been resisting is the very relationship that can change your life. And then the next step when you have that is to be baptized. Baptism is that outward symbol of that inward change. Baptism represents the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And the symbolism is the washing away of your sins to give you what? A pure heart. Sometimes someone will say to me, well, Gene, I've got this thing. I've got this issue. And once I fix that, then I'll get baptized. Listen, if you could fix it yourself, you wouldn't need Jesus to cleanse you and give you a pure heart. Baptism is all about new life in Christ. So today, I just want to help you. I want to help you respond to Jesus. Would you bow your head with me? And if God is working in your life today and you know right now you want him to make some changes in you, would you just pray just silently where you are? Just say, Jesus, I give you my heart today. I acknowledge that I need you. I'm surrendering my life to you. Jesus, I'm placing my trust in you. And I say yes to you as my personal Lord and Savior. In the Bible, every person who put their faith in Jesus, every single person was baptized. And so we wanna help you take that next step. And we've made all kinds of easy ways for you to do it. You can just open up your phone to the Eastside app right on the home screen. You can sign up or learn more about baptisms there. You can go to our website, baptism page, eastside.com slash baptism. Or you could just text the word right now. I said yes, just one word. I said yes to 545454. And we'll just send you a quick link to sign up for your baptism and more. Our, Our team would be delighted. At every campus, our online team would be delighted to help you figure this out and set it up. I'm gonna ask our campus pastors and hosts at each site to lead you in prayer right now. And I'll lead here. Thank you, Jesus, for being so merciful to us. Thank you for giving us not what we deserve, but what we really needed, your grace. Thank you for the freedom that many have found today already, just releasing offenders and and forgiving others who have hurt us, just as you have forgiven us. God, thank you for purifying hearts in ways that we can't through the blood of Jesus. You give us a pure heart and help us to keep realigning our priorities so that we maintain that pure heart. We're the same person that on the inside that people see on the outside and there's an authenticity and we don't have to live with all that uncomfortableness that comes from knowing there's an inconsistency in our lives. Thank you for the freedom of that. Thank you that when we have that pure heart, we see you, God. We, we, we see you at work in our lives. We see you in the beautiful world that you have made. We see you working in other people's lives and that we'll get to see you forever. We want to live upstream lives, God. And I pray for those who need to make this upstream courageous decision to be baptized today, that they'll go to the app or the website or just text the word I said yes and to make that decision and do it soon and to celebrate that pure heart that only you can give us. We're forever grateful and we lift our prayers now in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, so as you're leaving today, there's this tremendous small group expo out in the lobby and I hope you'll take some time to talk to people, you know, again, ask your questions. So many great opportunities this summer. If you haven't jumped into next steps yet, next weekend couldn't be a better opportunity to do it because it's the first weekend of the month. 
And uh, so you'll be right there on week one. And I love week one because I get to share my story and a little bit of the East Side story. And we get to start exploring a little bit. What are you going to do with your story? And uh, it would just be a great time to jump in. So next weekend, we're going to wrap up the Upstream series with the final two Beatitudes. I'm really excited about it. Our team has put together something special for next weekend. I love all of you so much. You have a great week, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.